So my goal here tonight is really to empower all of you and give you some resources to take home, um, let you know that as water polo coaches, you know, being here and being students of the game as well, you guys are, you know, 100% capable of cultivating great goalkeepers. Um, you know, obviously there's, there are resources out there for you and something I will talk about at the end is sort of building your tribe. And, you know, our sport though it's growing and making vast improvements, we also have the luxury of, it is a smaller sport, right? And we have a lot of functional relationships and a priority of mine to every athlete that I coach, and I say this to their parents, I say this to the athlete, is that I make myself available to you. So if something, you know, lingers past this talk in weeks to come and it's resonating with you or you're marinating on it, whatever, you know, reach out, you know, give me some time. I'm a little slow. Sometimes I have a crazy toddler. You probably saw him running around at this hotel earlier. But um, that's really important to me. I know Sean is very accessible and he puts his resources out there, um, both personally and from USA Water Polo. So um, today we're going to go over some fundamentals. We'll go over some technique stuff, and I want to give plenty of time at the back end. I'm sure that there are very specific questions. We're not going to have, we could do a whole weekend on, you know, just goalkeepers if we want to get into every, like, minute detail, like counterattack passing and whole set shots and skip shots and all that stuff. I want, to, I want to give you guys the opportunity to ask those questions, but I'm going to cover some basics first so that you guys can just kind of know where to start, know where you want to go, and kind of moving on from there. So this quote, hands light, stay low, block the ball. Um, is something that has stayed with me from the beginning of my experience on the national team. This was something that Kyle Kopp um, would always tell myself and our other goalkeepers in our 2008 group. Kyle Kopp was an Olympian and Olympic coach um, in the center position. Sean actually played with him. And um, he used to say, like, oh, yeah, you know, goalkeepers, all you got to do is hands low, hands light, stay low, block the ball. You make it harder than it is. <laughs> so there's that. Um, and then two quotes, actually, that I'll share with you before we get going. The first one is from a basketball player, Kyrie Irving. Most of you are probably familiar. He plays for the Celtics, was with the Cavs for a long time. If you've watched any of the Uncle Drew stuff that he's done, he has this great quote about basketball where, you know, it's not a game, it's an art form. You can master the fundamentals so you forget them and just focus on the task at hand, focus on the game in front of you and what's really important, which is getting buckets. And for goalkeepers, obviously getting blocks. But we spend so much time on technique. We spend so much time on fundamentals. We can go into week-long conversations on hand position and thumb position and degrees and angles. And that's all critical stuff to understand and have awareness of. But we learn all of that stuff so that it becomes somatic memory, right? So that we ingrain it into our bodies so that we teach it to our goalkeepers. And they can just move in that way in the cage for themselves and focus on following the ball so that we can have the personal trust with yourself as a goalkeeper and as a coach that they have the equipment, they have the necessity to make the save. And then, again, a Kyle Cobb quote, something that's always stayed with me uh, and his love for goalkeepers. He says, you know, ballet da dancers take something really complex and difficult and complicated and make it look effortless and beautiful. He says, well, goalies, they do the opposite. They take something easy and make it way more complex. So you have to have a light-hearted attitude, I think, about all of this stuff. We're going to spend a lot of time. You guys will spend a lot of time with your goalkeepers going over so much stuff, but at the end of the day, you have to also give them the space to learn how to do it, right? To learn how to follow the ball. And so the first topic we'll talk about with that, after this slide, we'll get into athlete selection. Um, so with all of this intro stuff, I just want to go, you know, uh, you know, suggest that you guys are really just adjusting your lens all the time, right? Like you're gonna look at big picture. Is my goalie able to even move to the ball? All right, and then you're going to zoom in, all right? You're going to zoom in to, like, finger position, hand position, knee position, foot position, how they're moving laterally in the cage, where they are with angles. You're going to zoom into all of this really minute detail, and then you're going to have to zoom out again, all right? Because you can't get stuck, you know, like, only on the little tiny stuff, so you can't see an athlete making the move to the ball. So what we're really working on here is optimizing a goalkeeper's reaction. Remember, we're, as a goalie, and we're always reacting. We're always, I tell this to all my goalkeepers, we're, you're going to be one step behind unless you're guessing, you know, which we don't really want to teach our goalkeepers to guess. We want to teach them to see why a shot's going to a certain direction. And so you're always going to be in this sort of one step behind mode. And so how are we going to optimize that? How are we going to close that gap and minimize that reaction time? And so, again, for you guys as coaches, I think just really allowing yourselves to take a step back. You know, once you get, it's easy to kind of get like 
oh my gosh, my goalie is like, keeps having this bad habit. I'm trying all these different things, how to break this habit. You know, allow yourself to step back and just like take some space, right? So especially if you're not a goalkeeper yourself, then you're kind of learning all this stuff with them. And that's okay. Okay, so where do you even start? We want to make sure that we're selecting the right athletes for goalkeepers, right? Myself, Sean, any goalkeeper is going to tell you it should be the most athletic person in the pool. We're probably dreaming that you guys are going to send your best athletes into the cage to become a goalkeeper. So you just want to make sure that you're selecting, you know, an athlete that is fit, an athlete that can be quick, an athlete that has some mobility, you know. And then also, an athlete can have all of these things, but, you know, at the end of the day, if you line 10 people up and throw a ball at them, there's going to be ones that kind of like shrink back and want to move away from the save, or there are going to be ones that are like, yeah, I'm going to get this. So, you know, kind of understanding the attitude that goes into wanting to block the ball. It takes a special kind of person. Probably <laughs> any field player will tell you goalies are their own, you know, tribe, their own movement. But, um, you know, that, that's that way for a reason. So I put this picture, you know, on the men's side when Johnny Hopper had to jump in the cage and make a really nice save. I mean, there are a lot of field players that you guys see that could actually have become really great goalkeepers and vice versa. So we'll start with technique. And I included this picture of Amanda Lung, and she's with her senior team right now, kind of as a joke, because if any really technically sound coach were to watch her play, you might kind of recoil a little bit. She doesn't always do things classically textbook. Um, you know, I've worked with her with two cycles on the junior team, and I continue to follow her career on the senior team, so I feel comfortable. I have a well enough relationship with her to say this. You know, when, she, when Sean and I both started working with her, you know, it's the type of player where she's incredibly athletic, she's incredibly talented, but we can't spend all this time trying to break all of her bad habits, right? Like she can block the ball doing what she's doing. And you guys see this too with Ashley Johnson in a lot of ways. She's sort of an unconventional, she's a very athletic player, but she's very unconventional. She's not exactly what you would call like the most classically technical goalkeeper. And so this is, these are the elements of the technique that we'll be covering today. Obviously there's a lot more than this that goes into the position, so that's why I want to give you guys Plenty of time at the end to ask specific questions. So when we talk about foundation, we're going to talk about our lower body and our upper body and how we bring the two together. So with base position, that's kind of the lingo that we use in ODP, we're talking about how our sort of operating position is. So that's any time you see your, egg your goalkeeper egg butering in the pool, where you want his or her hands, knees, feet, lower body parts to be, and then where her, his or her shoulders, hands, and head, everything, you know, just kind of if they're just treading in the water, right? So we talk about knee position. It's optimal to have your knees high, right? I think understanding the, the biomechanics of a lunge is going to help you optimize your base position. So you want to have your knees high. And then I think it's also really helpful to know what muscle groups you're, you're looking at activating in order to make a move to the ball. For goalkeepers, that's going to be a lot of hamstrings, a lot of glutes, a lot of back of the leg muscles, okay? And so that's going to help you too when you're looking at, you know, cross training or weight training or whatever. And so the higher your knees are, the more leverage you have to explode, all right? And I, t I show this to my goalies all the time. If my knee position is here and I make a lunge to the ball, I have all this space, all this time, all this distance to cover and to engage those muscle groups versus if my knees are down here, or floating a little bit behind me, I don't have that kind of space. You know, I don't, I need, or I need to bring my legs up, which again is gonna cut into our reaction time. So really focusing on having your knees high and then knowing your muscle groups, okay? Teaching your goalies, I think, anatomical awareness is key, right? The best athletes in the world are the ones that are the most self-aware. And that's not only like intuitively, that's not only, you know, like emotionally or mentally, but that's also physically, like Tom Brady or LeBron James, they know if their coach is telling them like, hey, I think you should actually like adjust your stance 10 degrees, you know, in this direction versus your goalkeepers, you're going to want them to know like, oh, I'm actually using my hamstrings or I'm using my glute muscles here. Like, where are my knees? Oh, my feet aren't even underneath my knees. Teaching that, you know, I've done a lot of yoga instruction and gone, undergone a lot of training for that. And there's a huge movement in, in body work these days and just understanding where you are in space, where your body is, is really important. So we call that proprioception, right? You want to know where your body is in space. Um, then your upper body. So talk about your shoulder position, your hand position, and then your operating baseline height is what I call just your level in the water. Um, so you really want to make sure, 
And your goal is you always want them to be sort of as high in the water as possible, right? You think about optics in the cage, and like a goalie <clears throat> whose shoulders are, you know, you can see sort of the top of his or her armpits versus, you know, just their neck and head, they're going to visually take up more space. And that to the shooter is going to just look like more surface area, more coverage in the cage. Um, the number one thing I think I hear from coaches and, you know, that I hear goalies, their coaches tell them are your hands are too low, your hands are too low, your hands are too low. And so we want the, I think there's a big, there's a misconception in that as goalkeepers, we always want our hands to be super light and we're always telling our goalies you're too heavy on your hands, you're too heavy on your hands, which is, you know, we don't want our hands to be deep. We want our hands to be accessible, but we're using our hands a lot, all right? Your goalies should be generating white water in front of them if a one on nobody is, you know, within the five meter line or they're five on six position and they're stepping around and someone's faking the ball five times, they're gonna be using their hands, you know, if, unless they're already out of the water. So that's okay if they're using their hands and they're treading here, we just don't want them deep, all right? We don't want them to have to work through that water to come up out from a low, low position. And something we'll talk about at the end is I think how we cue our goalkeepers is really important. So if we're telling our goalie, you're too heavy on your hands, be lighter on your hands, be lighter on your hands. Well, again, if a goalie is new and doesn't have the best body awareness, then we're sort of leaving it up to the goalie to figure out the solution to that, right? I mean, the goalie's like, I'm just trying to get out of the water. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna fix that problem, right? Can you tell your goalies, okay, like bring your knees higher, to bring your knees higher, bring your hips more underneath you. Look at those kind of like positive cues that you can find, those actions that that goalie can take so that their hands are no longer deep, all right? Think about your, your language, I think, too, as we're solving. And again, for, if you're not a goalie and this is new, you know, be on the journey with them. That's a really important thing. Um, baseline height, we talked about that. So core is really important because that's how you really connect your lower half and your upper half. And especially as we get like the ball getting passed around and you're whipping around the cage and having to step and slide and move in all sorts of positions, your core becomes critically important. Um, when you're just in your baseline foundation position and your knees are high, I often teach my goalies to have a coiled position and that's really, if you think about a spring, like I have a three-year-old, so he has a little curious George jack-in-the-box thing, you know, if you think about shoving the jack-in-the-box into the box and then it springs out, you know, it's that coil that allows for that, you know, extension. So I, I teach my goalies, your core is really like that coil. All right, it's holding your knee, it's, you're engaging all those muscle groups, your psoas, all of your different abdominal muscle groups to hold, to bring your knees up high and, and then you're going to have to explode, right, to the ball, make a movement to the ball in a different direction. So really having strong core strength, moving over your hips is huge. So you're not just talking core strength in terms of bringing your knees up or your front of your body, but we're talking about your lateral core as well, especially once we start moving around the, around the perimeter. And then personality. I sort of didn't know where to stick this one, and I thought it was good in foundation because, like, this is, again, a really fun thing for goalkeepers to develop. If you watch any... Goalkeeper, I mean, now we're just in such a great day and age because you guys can go on YouTube and like see every goalie in the world. You can see goalies from all over the place. And it's so much fun to see the different personalities, right? Like you have goalies that are like making crazy faces when they block five meters or waving at the refs. And you know, they have all these different personality types come out or you have the goalies that are just kind of stone cold, like all day, all day, I'm gonna be here, you know? So encouraging your athletes to really come into that position is gonna, again, give them ownership. You know, you don't want them obviously like out of control, but you wanna give them the ability to be empowered in this, in this position. So I, put Meryl, I thought Meryl was an appropriate person to put, she really um, has a strong personality come through any place. So getting into lateral movement. Um, so there are a lot of different schools of thought on lateral movement here, and as a player and as a coach, I sort of, I, I get stuck in between in this one a little bit. If you have a goalie that's smaller, they're gonna be moving laterally in the cage completely different than a goalie that's six feet tall. So this again is where we kind of need to zoom out and really look at the type of athlete that we're working with. If you're, if you're working with an athlete that has inc incredible, incredible quickness, right, and can move around, big or small, then there, he or she's gonna be in a different position than an athlete that's, you know, takes a little bit more time, likes to be more steady and get everything, everything set up underneath them. So that's where I think allowing yourself to not get too stuck in a specific way of, you know, teaching your goalkeeper how to do this and just really kind of bringing the position to him or her. 
to the extent that you can, <laughs> right? In an ideal world, we would be able to do that with every player. So talk about stepping, and that to me is when we're moving around laterally in the cage and we're staying in as much of a balanced position as possible, all right? So we're moving using our lead leg. If the cage is behind me, you guys will see me do this a lot. I apologize because I know this table is blocking you. But if the cage is behind me, then I'm using this lead leg. I'm bringing my hips and my upper body at the same time. So I'm talking about my lower body foundation and my upper body foundation. I'm really working to keep this balanced the whole time I'm in the cage, all right? And the focus on as I make this movement is really with the lead leg, all right? So I'm bringing that leg up, I'm opening up, I'm pulling water, and I'm staying balanced, all right? That keeps both of my legs underneath me at once. And look, when we're training and in lunges and we're practicing, we're drilling our goalkeepers, they're always moving from a balanced position, right? The funny thing is, is that the majority of the time when we're making a save in the cage, we're coming from a position of imbalance. So it's kind of like we want to prepare them for the best, what is that, what's that quote? It's like, I know you know it, it's like a uh, strive for perfection, achieve excellence, right? So we're always teaching them they wanna be in this balanced position, but at the end of the day, they also have to be ready to move to the ball when they're not completely balanced. So for sliding, that's what tends to be, what we tend to see when we're covering greater distances in the cage, right? So again, in an ideal world, or when we train in the cage, we often set our goalies up, cages behind us, Ball starts at one, step to two, step to three, step to four, step to five, move around in this balanced position, squaring at every position, but rarely does it, the passing sequence go like that during a game. So then we often have to go from two down to five or from four over to one on a six on five pass and do that you know, three times in a row before a shot comes. And you know, our hips, our goalie's hips end up being on one side of the cage and their upper body ends up being on the opposite side of the cage. So how do we, train that? How do we prepare them to make a move from the ball if their hips are one way and their hands are in another position? And so this is where your core strength becomes critical. Again, that, those abdominal muscles on the front of your body, if you're able to draw your knees in while your hips are over here, you can still make a move to the ball, all right? You, goalies can do that, all right? It's within their capabilities. It just takes you know, again, learning the position and learning the movements in the water. A drill that I think is great for that is just pendulums. So your goalie's treading here in the water. You tuck your knees up into your stomach like you're doing a cannonball, and you shoot your legs one way, and then you shoot your legs the other way. They can do it while they're holding a water polo ball for leverage on the surface, or they can do it while they're sculling. All right, and so that really builds the lat the not use like the oblique core strength, the front core strength, um, and that can again give them just this comfort of being able to kind of learn the leverage in the water, learn how to feel and feel imbalanced and learn how to be comfortable with that. Um, and then again, this is going to transition us into geography in the cage, but finishing square with the shooter. So again, optics are huge in the goalkeeper position. And the more comfortable, the more experienced your goalkeepers get, the more, the more they're going to understand this and the more you guys will see this. But you know, I think for me as a player, I, it was always really critical to me to be square with the person who had the ball. And so when you're stepping or when you're sliding, you really want to make sure that you're completing that movement and squaring yourself with a shooter. And I always teach that like if our shoulders, our shoulders are just aligned, right? So like, like Melissa, if your shoulders were to turn like 30 degrees one direction, my shoulders would kind of turn too. So I'm always working on maintaining a square position. Again, so that, that shooter sees as much surface area as possible. Um, and that, you know, comes into understanding the angles of the cage. And we can talk about that more specifically um, if you guys have questions about that. I think there's some cool work to be done in that area. So that's an important thing to bring up with sliding. I think the tendency with sliding that we see and why we don't like to teach it necessarily maybe early on or as the first movement is you know, a goalie can, once your hips are one way, the, the, what the body naturally wants to do is really pull water with their hand. And what that does is that takes up what your hand's doing, right? You're no longer, if the shot comes while you're pulling water, you know, you can't get out. All right, so stepping, your hands are more balanced. Your hands are moving in unison with your hips and your legs, which is all trying to remain sort of in this like column in the pool. Um, however, with sliding, I think it's really important, again, that you learn how to use the surface of the water so that you're really sculling. And you do use that lead hand for balance, for leverage. You're just not bringing it deep in the water. So you're using, it's okay if it's like a little bit before, below the surface, but if you think about 
like and you guys stand up paddle Southern California, you know, like stand up paddle boards or like kayak paddles. You think about how you use that paddle in the water without bringing it deep, but you just, if you had to turn your paddle board around, right, you kind of like use it on the surface of the water. You can kind of imagine your hands doing the same thing for those of you guys that are familiar. And so I put this, not to be, not for my own glorification, but I put this picture in because, you know, you see that my hips are over here, and this is a six on five situation, you know, this is in Beijing, we're playing China, and, you know, so in six on five, you know, you're moving quickly around the cage, it's a challenge to keep your hips directly underneath you, and so I really, you know, I can't say for certain because it was 10 years ago, but the pass, you know, is likely coming up from the six position on six on five, you have this right hander here, catch and shoot cross cage. So if, again, the cage is behind me, I'm coming up here and I have to, you know, before I can get my legs underneath me, I have to employ my knees, employ my lower half to really get my body out of the water. So again, it's very often that our goalkeepers will have to make a move to the ball without feeling completely balanced. And we have to know that you can still make amazing saves while you're doing that. So geography in the cage, how to position yourself. So there's, again, a little, this is a little room for debate here. I was actually always told that I played too deep in the cage like throughout my entire career. So I tend to um, not come out. But you see the national team goalies, especially on the women's side, on this generation, they come out a lot. They come out aggressively. They play out of the cage. And so really, um, point number two, just giving your goalies time to position themselves correctly. Um, and giving them time to understand, you know, like when to come out. So that starts with understanding the defense's responsibilities in front of you. You know, I will embarrassingly admit it wasn't until I graduated from college, likely, and joined the national team that I was like, oh my gosh, like my job is so much easier. I have this amazing zone defense in front of me. I like, you know, I knew like that these defensive players were going to be taking a lane and I could position myself behind them and I could really understand the specs of like, you mean I don't have to cover this entire, I mean you do as a goalie obviously, we don't want to teach our goalies that like explicitly, but you know really allowing them to understand that it's a shared responsibility between the goalkeeper and the defense and how that breaks down, all right? Like so specifically for five on six, specifically for zone defense, you know how do we position ourselves so that we're not directly behind the shot blocker and that that goalie can not only trust that the shot blocker is taking the right water, but how to direct him or her into that space um, is huge. And then also with giving your goalies time to position themselves correctly, I'm just gonna have my little goalkeeper PSA <laughs> when you're doing shooting drills. Give your goalkeeper time for at least like half of the drills to get set up. I think it's good, you know, when we're doing rapid shooting and they kind of have to scramble, that also like makes your goalie step into a higher gear, but it's not gonna be useful 100% of the time. So make sure that, you know, you're, sh you're not doing, you know, fake as many times as you want inside of the four meter line to a shot with no defense all of the time, right? So like give, keep your goalkeepers in mind when, um, when you're setting up your shooting drills so that they can kind of learn all of these responsibilities too and practice talking to their defense. We so often wait until we get into five on six or half court defense before we're like, hey, why aren't you talking, why aren't you talking? Like tell your goalkeepers to talk during warm up shooting, all right, get a shot blocker out there. You know, we can always, always work on shot blocking. Um, Understanding when to come out and when to play out, I think that that is really important. So counterattack, you know, long counterattack passes, teaching your goalie like when to kind of come out to inhibit the other goalkeeper from making that long pass. You know, if there's an overpass, um, you know, how far he or she can go, finding that threshold. And we have to encourage them to fail at that in order for them to learn. I think, um, you know, it's so, it's like the most devastating thing in the world if you get scored on like a full court or a half court shot, but you have to practice that stuff in practice in order for them to really understand that threshold. There, there's no way if they're waiting until it's safe, then they're never gonna come out. Um, so kind of encouraging them to come out sooner, you know, two meter tip outs, if there's an opportunity for the goalkeeper to kind of get into the passing lane, whether it's five on six, you can get, you know, ready to make a tip pass if they're trying to thread the post, or you can come in um, on six on six, take help the, the defender, you know, take a center lane to limit center opportunities. And then again, just really encouraging your goalkeeper to commit to it, all right? The, the word, we see this right when we're doing like uh, M defense or something. If you guys see like your defensive players swim all the way to the person and then they stop, <laughs> right? So that's like, come on, you're there. You gotta just go for it. 
Um, and again, that comes from learning and getting comfortable and having the encouragement to do so. Uh, movement to the ball, I'm just checking my time. Um, so really, just in this section, I'm going to talk about lunges, controlling the ball, block, tracking the ball, and hang time. Um, obviously, there's like a million different types of specific shots. And this is what I want to give you guys the opportunity when you, if you have those specific questions, because I don't have time to cover every single one. Um, a huge question that I get asked a lot and that I see in coach is, do we go with one arm or two arms? Um, again, it's going to depend on the size of your goalkeeper and understanding where the shot is coming from, how much travel time the shot has from shooter to the cage is just that you can cover a greater distance, okay? So as soon as we go with two, we're not able to cover as far in the cage. Um, so if we're talking about, you know, high corner shots, shots that are spreading the goalkeeper wide, high or low, we really want to make sure that, okay, if our goalie is going with two every single time and not getting, the, not getting the touch, how can we work around that? The advantage to two hands, again, is surface area, as you guys can see. So especially on the low shots, you know, the skip shots that are a little harder to, you know, gauge, harder to read, we have more surface area when we can go with two. All right, so, you know, shots that come, this was one that I always struggled with as a player, but shots that come really close and are on the water, okay, I was super vertical in the cage. I'm 6'2", six, six so I was able to get out really high, right? And this was like a, a vulnerability for me. So, you know, if a shot's coming here, can we get our body behind it and get two hands behind it to really, um, you know, get as much surface area behind the block as possible? I think that, um, truthfully, I always try to teach one. I think um, just because that's how I played and it's easier for me and my body to, to teach my goalkeepers how to do that. But, you know, I, it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. And um, with movement to the ball and surface area, I always try to teach my goalkeepers to block through the block. I think that you don't need your whole body behind a high corner shot in order to make the save. But if you're trying to get your body there, then you're going to have more distance there. You're going to have more hang time which is what we talk about when we're, we're discussing our vertical position in the water, okay? When we're up and a ball gets deflected or it's an off-speed shot or we make a misread and we jump too soon, we're going to need to tap into our hang time, all right? And that, that comes from, you know, a couple different techniques in the legs. We have the double kick, which is, you know, like an extra. You're doing a big vertical explosion to the ball, so you do that giant breaststroke kick, and then it's like a 30% breaststroke kick, all right, once you're up. So you're bringing your knees back up, and you're taking another little pump. All right, there's a drill we can talk about. Michael Jordan's, it's probably something you guys are, some of you may be familiar with. We'll go over it at the end. Um, controlling the block, and that's just, you know, we see this often in beginning goalkeepers where they make the save and it bounces way back out into the, into the field of play. So controlling the block is being able to, you know, control the ball down in front of you and knock it down. I think that, um, again, the more you get your body behind the save, the more leverage you're going to have in controlling the block. So that's another advantage to really trying to move with your body. I tell all my young, new goalkeepers to block with their hearts. And so that means like you, get your, you try to get your heart, your center behind every, every block, OK? It's kind of a double meaning. So you know, you obviously, we want to block everything as goalkeepers. Um, and so really getting your core behind that. And that will help you control the ball more. All right, you're just going to be able to, to smother that. We don't want our goalies like falling hard on top of the ball, but you want to have some forward momentum. Um, tracking the ball, that's just simply your ability to follow the ball from the shooter to your hand. It sounds super like, yeah, no problem, your goalie's like, job is to track the ball. But I will share a quote at one point before 2012, Adam said to me, you know, it was like he had been thinking about it a long time. And he goes, I just don't really think that you see the ball. And I was like, that's like my one job. <laughs> Come on. And then after I, like, my ego, you know, I let my ego aside and started thinking about it a little bit more, I do think that as a goalkeeper, especially the more coached we get and the more technique and the more, you know, everything we get sort of locked into this checklist of I'm sending my body to go block the save, to go make the save, you know, we can kind of get lost in that to-do list along the way. And even though we're watching the ball, it's like, how many of you guys, you know, are tired, you're driving, and you go through a light, and you're, I mean, hopefully we're not all running red lights, but you, you're like, wow, did I even make that stop? Maybe it's just me. <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, there's just, we, we go on autopilot, right? Like, the more you learn, the more these fundamentals you employ, 
you know, the easier it is to kind of check out. So it's finding that edge of being able to build the muscle memory, but not completely turn on autopilot and check out. Um, and hang time I touched on. That's our ability to just stay up, all right? And that, you know, comes from experience. It comes from athleticism. And I think it comes from just a combination of leg strength and core strength and the ability to kind of keep going um, once you make that move. So really employing those legs after, comes in recovery, right? I, that's actually something we should talk about because it's, it's not moving to the ball, it's sort of after you move to the ball, but the ability to control how you fall. You guys probably have worked with some goalies where as soon as they go to the ball, it's like, okay, I'm there and then I'm done. And then the rebound goes and they get scored on or whatever, you know? So the, I think that teaching that technique, teaching that ability to really follow the ball and follow it, you know, even after the save is made or it's deflected and recover and stay engaged with the play until it's completely in your possession. Okay. Next steps. 20 minutes. We're good. Um, so conditioning. That's a big question that we get a lot. Um, you know, I have probably done every single school of theory on <laughs> uh, conditioning. Um, I personally like the way I feel best when I was playing when I did some swimming. Um, that's not for everyone. That's not for every goalkeeper. Before 2008, we rarely swam more than maybe 800 or 1,000 yards. That would be a big swimming day for the goalies. You know, if we're like doing 50s or 100s, that was big for us. Um, I think that there is a type of aerobic fitness that you get with swimming that you really can't get in a lot of other ways. And it also creates just an ability to move and be comfortable in the water. And again, we're not going to be sticking our fastest swimmers in to become goalies, but it's a, it's a position that relies a great deal on quickness and fast twitch muscle ability, and you can cultivate that through some sets a lot. That being said, you can be a phenomenal goalkeeper without doing any swimming whatsoever. So I think it's finding, again, really kind of allowing yourself to see what your goalies can do. Um, and a little bit of swimming won't hurt, but you don't want to waste, I mean, we're working on limited time and resources, a lot of you, if we're talking about like club and high school level, so we're not going to have, you know, tons of time to just build a swimming base. It's something you can always encourage your goalkeepers to do on their own, and it's an easy thing for him or her to show up at the pool. You can send them swim sets, you know, nothing more than like 150s or 200s included in the set on occasion. I would, I would suggest mostly like, again, if you're looking, like, the high school goalies that I work with on an individual basis, if they're doing swimming like three times a week, I'll probably send them anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 yards, broken down like solid three to 500 warm up, 200 cool down included in that, and then I'm looking at doing like 75s, freestyle breaststroke, butterfly. You know, I think butterfly is huge, that just getting used to coming out of the water, being big out of the pool, it really requires a lot of core strength in butterfly. Um, incorporating strokes, 150s that are like 50 free, 50 breast, 50 free. All that stuff can be really useful. That being said, again, like I, like I mentioned, you don't have to tell your goalies to become swimmers. You don't ha they don't have to be swimmers. But then you're going to be looking at a lot of leg stuff. And you also want to look at other ways to bring their heart rates up for an extended period of time. All right? Yes, as a goalkeeper, we're talking about 30 seconds, 35 second shot clock, 30 second shot clock. Tip out, maybe you're there for like a minute, a minute and a half if things get messy on defense. And then you have about 30, 40 seconds recovery window. So it's important to pay attention to those intervals when you're doing leg stuff especially. You know, we don't want to start giving our goalies like 10 minute long leg sets that are going to blow out their knees at a young age. So really making sure that you're giving them the type of rest that they need. I don't think you need to be doing super, super heavy stuff on their legs. I think, um, you know, water jugs are okay. Heavy balls are okay. You don't need to get crazy, though, with, like, every single piece of special equipment that you have so that they're wearing weight belts and holding bars and <laughs> have the resistance cord until they're on the senior team. Um, otherwise, I'm a huge fan of resistance belts. I think that anything you can do with that resistance belt tied to the side of the pool, especially lateral movement-wise, so you're stepping with a resistance belt, you're sliding with a resistance belt, you're doing lateral lunges with that belt. Again, it just forces you to, that goalkeeper to use the core strength and to get comfortable with having to, oh my gosh, I just landed from this lunge, my legs are trying to move to the wall, really making sure you know, that they have to work to get their legs back underneath them quickly. Resistant, I, I think that that is probably one of the single best pieces of equipment for goalkeepers. Um, repetition, I mean, this is, again, coaches that have been players up to the senior team, it's kind of, you know, you get asked for, I get asked for goalkeeper drills all the time. And from my own, you know, I, I give them plenty of, like, 
the fancy ones that I see from other people that I think are effective, but like from my own personal experience, it's really about practicing the fundamentals over and over and over again. All right, so we don't need to get super elaborate, especially at a young age or a beginner level. I mean, we want to keep them interested, but we also, you know, the more we get lost in doing this like crazy special cool drill, the less they're kind of picking up on like where their legs are in space and where their hands are and all that stuff. So really finding a balance between those two is important and making sure that just the simple like grind and repetition is, is there, you know? And then allow yourself to see progress. I think for goalkeepers, it's like, unless they're making the saves, then we're like, need to fix everything, right? So we really need to be able to see and teach our goalkeepers to see progress if he or she makes a good move to the ball and doesn't maybe get the save but ends up in a better position than, than he or she did the first time. That's really critical, especially for those that want to be goalies and didn't just get stuck there. They want to block everything. You know, they really do. And so that, that develops into the mindset. You know, we can talk a little bit about the mental components later if you guys want. Um, Practice planning, so this is a big one, right? Because all of the stuff I just gave you is like, if you have a full-time goalie coach like standing over your, over your club practices three times a week when you have your goalies, which is typically not the case. So, um, you know, learning how to effectively employ all of this stuff is gonna be huge. So do you have a senior level goalkeeper that, you know, you can have like one goalie session every other week or once a month where you have like a goalies only practice for 45 minutes before your actual training. And the, you know, the goalie that's a little more advanced can really hold on to some of this stuff and be a leader, you know, so that you can just write out, you know, their, their workout, their training before your club practice um, so that they kind of are familiar with the drills and you change, they get a couple weeks with them and then you change it up. Um, so finding a leader is huge. Using video, like this is something that I haven't done a ton of yet. We use, we do a ton of a video in, Olympic development program, we're always taking video of our goalies, and I think it's super useful for your goalies. I mean, it's really eye-opening and like cringeworthy to see yourself play. And, um, but even using videos for drills, right? Like you can, like, um, you know, one of our colleagues at, with the Olympic development program, he is constantly sending his, they're sending their goalkeepers workouts and drills before they come to practice so that they're familiar with what, okay, this is what we're doing today, you know? And you, so using, you know, kind of building a cache of video with your goalies that you can, um, you know, use throughout your, your club practices. And then, like I said, build your village, find your tribe, you know, our sport, again, like cross-pollinate, you know, be functional and, and how you're working um, with your colleagues because especially if you aren't a goalkeeper, then like I said, from the beginning, we're, you guys are on the journey with them, you know? And so being able to, you know, as a coach and especially as a teacher and as a parent, it's always really, you feel like you need to have all the answers, right? Like someone's gonna ask you a question and it's like, man, but if you don't know, like, let's find out together, you know? Like, let's learn this together. That's really important um, as a coach for any of the positions in the field, not just the goalkeepers, but it might be the most relevant. And then I touched on this in the beginning, but language, how we coach them, I think we can be super effective if we're offering an action that he or she can do to correct an error that we see. So again, the, the first one that always comes to mind with me is, you're too heavy in your hands, you're too heavy in your hands, so let's bring our knees up, okay? Or we're not watching the ball, we're not watching the ball, well, what can we zoom in on? Like, what can, can you find the Mikasa symbol on the ball? You know, are they getting lost in the field player's eyes or shoulder position, all right? Can you see the lines on the ball, the colors on the ball? Something like that. Um, and then also, language that our goalkeepers use. That's a really important one for how they talk to their teammates in the pool. Tone is everything, right? Like if you have a goalie that's sort of freaking out back there, <laughs> telling your defense to get into a certain position, then that's gonna disrupt the entire vibe of your defense, right? Like it's gonna be like frantic mode versus, you know, you want a goalie that's gonna be commanding and confident um, and, you know, direct. You know, I tell my goalies, it's. It's all about us, right? Like we're putting the defense in the correct position so that we can make our save. Um, and really giving them that ownership and that power to understand that. And again, when they're new, they're not gonna be right 100% of the time, but they have to learn you know, how to do that. Um, and I think that's my last slide. And we have about 15 minutes, so I wanna we could probably go over a little too if you guys have a lot of questions, but yes. For base position, um, I think it's it's good to get some weight belts in there. That's okay. Weight belts, heavy balls. Um, I think really bringing the focus to getting your shoulders out of the water is huge. And transitioning from 
you know, holding a weight ball for 10 or 20 seconds into jumps, you know, so they, they can really feel that transition from one into the other. That's actually going to help him or her bring their base position up as well. Um, yeah, weight balls. And probably the med balls are a little more effective in that. And just like feeling the difference and how they move into a lunge low in the water versus high in the water. If they're low in the water, they have so much more water resistance to get through versus if he or she is out, you know, they can get to the ball much more quickly. Um, what technical aspect do you believe has most to play with base height? Would it be hand, speed, knee height? Um, leg strength, I think, is huge. Uh, the stronger your goalie's legs are, the, the more they're going to be able to kind of be high in the water with less work, you know? I think also you can even use the resistance cords for baseline height. Like, you don't have to be in the baseline position to generate that strength. Like, using a resistance cord again, like horizontal in the water, have him or her hold a ball and just let, you know, pull in from the other way. Um, is big, but especially when you're doing all this stuff, focusing on keeping your knees high is big. I don't think that the knee height, like a, a you know, that's going to be more of a factor when we're talking about moving to the ball, is having the knees high. I think that's where it's like, if your knees are low, you're either going to have to take the three seconds or two seconds it's going to take to bring them up before you move to the ball, or you're just not going to be able to get out of the water as high. You, uh, you mentioned Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So that, I mean, and this is, you know, we do this Olympic development program too. It's, it's this drill where, like, every line, the goalkeeper's just walking forward in between each lane, or you can put cones on the edge. Um, they're walking forward in a nice, solid, high base position. I usually say about like 85%. You know, hands sculling on the surface. Every time they get to a lane or a cone, they're doing a huge vertical jump as high as they can. Two hands, falling as slowly as possible. But then instead of just putting their hands down and recovering the water, you're immediately going into another jump. So you're keeping your hands out the whole time. And then again, resisting the fall. And you do it a third time. All right, so that really helps, I think, also teach us teach goalkeepers how to maintain leverage, you know, once you're already out of the water, you know, you feel like you're sinking, how am I gonna, how am I gonna use my legs again to really bring my body back out of the water or maintain height? Mm -hmm. uh, how important would you say is to like vary drills and workouts and different things that they're doing and what are some recommendations you have to like make the workouts creative and interesting for them? Because like a lot of times, as you know, like you're working with 20 athletes and one or two of them are goalies. Right. And so a lot of times they do stuff on their own. Yeah. Goalies in the corner. We'll see you in 20 minutes. Yeah, no, that's important. No, and it's important to mix it up. Um, it's, it's important to teach them that, you know, they can get quality work in without a coach looking over their shoulder 100% of the time. So I think it's, it, you do want a lot of variety. And that's where I think like if you are looking at a month of practice planning, you know, like having a theme of the week is huge. You know, like this week we're going to work on high corners. This week we're going to work on five on six positioning, you know, moving to a block from five on six positioning. Kind of pick a theme for each week. And you don't actually have to mix the drills. Uh, you don't have to have a new drill each week. But having that different focus, you know, they could even be doing the same drill. But if you take the focus into a different area, you know, it might just shine a different light on it, you know, put it through a different lens for him or her. Um, with that being said, you do have to mix it up, right? You're not going to give them the same. I mean, you know, I probably did the same drills like over. I mean, there's probably like 10 drills <laughs> to, like for 10 years on the national team or something, you know. But I think, um, you know, just kind of alternating between the condition, the types of conditioning that you do, you know, you do heavy stuff one day, you do resistance bands another day, you do swimming another day, maybe throughout the course of a week, if you have four practices, right, you have a different conditioning each day for 15, 20 minutes, and then you do 20 minutes of technique, however long you have with your goalkeepers, you know, and then you can also coordinate that conditioning in with the technique, right? Like if you're doing five on six, maybe we'll do heavier stuff on our legs today because we're talking about being in a vertical position where we're working for an extended period of time versus if we're talking about, you know, explosive high corner lunges, then maybe you do a little swimming that day because it's aerobic, it gets your body moving, you know, kind of figuring out how to link those two together um, can work. How much dry land did you find that was benefit for you, whether it's doing lunges, stairs, not with weights, but mm -hmm. just dry. Yeah, like hard, yeah, just uh, alternating your workout. I think dry land's awesome. I think I'm a huge 
believer in dryland. I think encouraging any athlete to you know get out and go for a run, and you know we don't want to again put their knees at risk or anything like that. But for goalkeepers, I think yoga is huge. You know, just having that. I you know I, that's just because I'm kind of drank the Kool-Aid a long time ago, and I think it's a really powerful thing for any athlete. But it gives you that. Our, you know, this generation of young athletes that we're coaching, they don't slow down. And so it gives them that recovery time. It gives them the opportunity to really be in his or her body and, and learn again, hey, step this foot forward, move your knee to this position, you know, teach where these body parts are, which again, for like middle school, high school, girls and boys is not always super intuitive, you know? Um, especially if you're not gonna be doing a ton of swimming with your goalkeepers, then you're gonna wanna look at something uh, that can get his or her heart rate up and get them just into a good physical shape. Um, again, that's not always going to come directly from the water, and that's fine. And as far as you know, lunges and weight training, I think you want to make sure that you introduce that stuff at an appropriate pace and an appropriate level. I don't think you know, like lunges can be a little hard on your knees and. You know, if you have a super healthy athletic athlete, it's fine to introduce all that stuff, but if you're also gonna be focusing on just heavy leg stuff in the pool, then you wanna make sure that that's staying balanced between the two. Um, I ran a lot, you know, we ran a lot. The, again, we ran and swim a lot, probably because we didn't have like a specific goalkeeper coach the whole time leading up to the London games. But, um, you know, I found that I actually really liked feeling in that level of shape. And by no means would I say it was better than the 2008 training I was in. We did very technically oriented training. We did a lot of heavy stuff, a lot of bars overhead, a lot of weights, weight belts, and just heavy vertical stuff that was all based around movement. And I think that's fine too. You know, I think it's, again, kind of gauging your athlete. And for younger athletes, it's kind of nice to like mix it up, especially if they're a multi-sport athlete. Yeah, just incorporating the goalie uh, into the greater team concept as opposed to the goalie over there in the corner. Yeah. So I mean, just thoughts. Yeah, I think, um, right, I think really, um, especially on those defensive talks and like making sure, the thing is, is I think also for myself, you know, growing up in Michigan, I didn't have a specific goal, like I had coaches that took interest in me because they saw that I was talented, right, but I didn't have like a goalie coaching me, and so I think also just teaching your goalies offense and defense and making sure that they understand the game. I mean, at this, at this sort of club level and high school, middle school level, you know, they're new to the game as well. And again, it wasn't until, it was probably when I got onto the senior team that I was like, oh, my defense is so much easier because there's a systematic defense in front of me. But like, it wasn't until I got to college that I really started paying attention to what my offense was doing, you know? And so it's important for them to know like, hey, I'm making the pass, why am I passing to the right on a counter attack? Like, we always tell our goalies to pass to the right, but like, I didn't know why that was until I probably went to college. Like, oh, they're actually, all the field players are gonna catch a strong side then. And you know, because it's easy for a goalie to check out if they're not held accountable. So making sure that they're learning that stuff too. Like if you're giving your team quizzes on plays and offense, like make the goalies do it too. Um, and that can help kind of out of the water. And then in practice, you know, that's sort of tough. I think, you know, it depends if you want to go the route of like, are my goalies going to be swimming a little bit? Or are they going to be doing this a little bit? But it's okay to like, you know, there were times even when I was training before 2008 that, you know, our, our coaches were like, hey, you guys are going to do this releasing drill with us. I mean, goalies need to get used to having pressure on them. You know, they're going to get it pressed for the ball. They're going to need to learn how to like handle, you know, looking for their teammate while someone's trying to come at them. So, you know, it's okay to incorporate them a little bit. Like, don't be afraid. It's not going to like ruin their goalie development, you know. So I think it doesn't have to always be one or the other. Mm. Yeah, passing, um, really making sure that they're getting comfortable handing the ball. I think handling the ball, you know, you start off passing, I always have my goalies alternate hands. You want them to be able to control with their non-dominant hand as well as their dominant hand. Um, so, you know, uh, they don't really need to go like full court passes with their opposite, you know, their left if they're righty, but um, making sure that they're maintaining great height in the water. That only not, that only, that not only fa facilitates an easier pass, but it allows them to be seen by the team that's swimming down the pool, right? So it's really important for that, your goalkeeper, you know, as they're looking to make that counterattack pass, they're high in the water, all right? They're holding the ball up. And so when you're, when they're drilling counterattack release passes or long distance passes, you know, I always have my goalies hold the ball for three to five seconds and visualize, use your imagination. We have to get really 
imaginative as goalkeepers. Use your imagination that you're looking for that release, you're scanning the pool, and then you're making that pass from up here versus like, okay, I'm here, long pass, you know? Kind of just encouraging all that game situation. And then, yeah, how much time you spend on it is gonna depend on how much time you have and how much work they need. So for the longer passing, you really wanna teach your goalies to use their entire core, right? They're going to be, you know, working on a torque or a twist more to get their whole core involved so that they have a lot of leverage behind that pass that will go further. You want to talk about the timing of the pass, you know, so if the, depending on how close the defense is on the counterattack, how much time do they want the pass to be, you know, you're going to have more arc on it if that's the case versus, you know, a line drive if the defender is trying to clobber, you know, your teammate and then placement, you know, how to place it around the person that's on the advantage or not, you know. Um, eye contact is, you know, something I always teach at a young age. I think it can be, you know, for players that have been playing together for a long time, I'm willing to, you know, say you don't have to have eye contact if they know each other really well. But um, really in the beginning, we don't want our goalies just going rogue with everyone in the pool. So making sure that they can get it on the hand, like that the field player knows it's coming. And then even after the pass is made, right, communicating where that pass is. Like, because you have all your other def you have all your other teammates looking back at you, hey, balls out right or balls out left or wherever. Uh, do you think you might be able to touch on uh, mental toughness in that aspect of the game? And then I actually have a, one more question. Yeah. Uh, is there a time that you gambled and won in a game? And is there a time that you gambled and lost? Mm -hmm. Gambling, that's a quicker answer. So I'm trying to think if anything specific. I'm sh sure the answer is yes. I mean, I've, <laughs> I, would like, I would hope. I'm sure it's yes, but I can't think of a specific instance. It's all blurred together through the sleep deprivation, I think. Um, but that's an important, I mean, I think that goes back to what I touched on earlier with, you know, giving our goalkeepers the space to fail. And it's important that we teach them to take that risk, right? I, and I said, as a player, like, I actually played pretty deep in the cage, and I hated going out. So, yeah, I mean, I can say, like, there were times that I went out and probably either stopped and went back on a counterattack pass or just, you know, I don't think I ever got scored on, like, by another goalkeeper, at least at the international level. And, but... I definitely got scored on like half court shots. Um, and then mental toughness, yeah, that's huge. I think that, that comes a lot from us. Again, it's, I'm a broken record, but giving our goalkeepers the space to fail and allowing them to come back from that. I will, you know, I know Sean mentioned the, the tough water polo game. Do you guys know what game he's talking about? Anyone? It's been, a, it's been a while, so <laughs> there's been a lot more excitement since then. But in 2000, and so something, I mean, you guys all know this because you're coaches and fans of the sport, but, you know, something that a lot of people don't realize is how the, the USA has to qualify to go to the Olympics. I can't tell you how many athletes I have that show up that are like, so when do you leave for the Olympics? Like, you know, two years before you're even qualified. And um, so this was in 2011 when we had to qualify for the 2012 Olympics at Pan American Games, and we ended up playing Canada in the final, and you know, and in, went into this insane shootout. But I think what, what allowed us to be successful in that game at that time, that was in October of 2011, was really the year that we had leading up to that experience. And we played at World Championships in Shanghai earlier that summer. And it was 2011 World Championships, a really big deal. As you guys know, like the year before the Olympic year, it's always a, you know, who's going who's gonna to win, who's going to be the sort of favorite going into the Olympic Games. And we got sixth place. I think we got so we lost in our final to Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So we got we didn't get fifth. We got sixth. So we ended with a loss. Um, and we just I mean, you know, the tournament like we started off okay. We lost in our quarterfinal to Russia, which was you know like a really messy game, and you know didn't really fall onto our side. But um, you know it was just the worst place finish. That we, and then after that the wheels fell off. It was like we lost our quarterfinal. We won our next game because then we were you know, into the fifth, sixth place game, but we lost the final game in Australia. I mean, we just like, I don't know, it's, I blocked it out. But uh, I actually got pulled <laughs> in the fourth quarter of that game. So, um, yeah, I mean, it was horrible. I mean, you guys, when was the last team our, when was the last team our women, last time our women's team went to a tournament and didn't get first place. So it's been a while and that, you know, was like the worst world championships finish our senior women's team had probably ever had in like 20 years. And so we had to go back, and then three, that was what, August, end of July, August, and then in October we had to go play our qualification tournament for 
the Olympics the following year. And, you know, I would say if at that time, if our, if our USA team played Canada 10 times, we probably would have won nine out of 10 times, right? Like we were, you know, it was a rivalry game. It was always a close game, but it was never like, oh, are we gonna, you know, it was never like playing, I don't know, like Russia or something. I feel like would have been a little bit more scary, but that's just probably for me being a goalie. Um, so we played Canada and we, in Guadalajara, Mexico, and we were down, we're down at halftime, I think it wasn't anything super drastic at half. It was like maybe four to one or something, which like whatever. We were down at the end of the first quarter. Like it, you know, it was like we were getting our shots. We just weren't making them right, and they were just their shooters were on. <laughs> Look at Melissa, like, she's like <laughs> recoiling. Um, we were down five to one. Yeah, no, going into the fourth quarter, then we were down seven to two. So we were down by five. Maybe it was that, actually, maybe that was halftime. Maybe going into the fourth, we were down seven to three. I don't know, I can't remember. Anyway, so then uh, one of our teammates, Courtney, stepped up and scored like all of the goals to tie the game. And then in, in the fourth quarter solely, so it's seven to seven, there's less than a second on the shot clock, and their center earns an exclusion, <laughs> and so they have, or earns a five meter, five meter penalty. So there's no time on the clock, seven seven, they have a penalty shot to take. So, this was the greatest moment of my athletic career, most likely. I was able to make a save. <laughs> um, we come up with a save on the five meter penalty, and then we played two three minute periods for overtime, no scoring, and then we go into a shootout. However, the shootout was like six rounds of a shootout. So, it was, I think, at least three rounds for both teams before we scored, and then, or before we, they made a save, and then we made a save. I don't know if I actually saved the ball. I think the goal was on my team in this game quite a bit. I should take credit for it, but it was, you know, it, it, um, one of them I touched. We, we had two blocks. One of them I touched, and one of them was the bar. So anyway, we then continue into another two or three rounds of a shootout, and the final score was like 29-28 or something. It was the, you know, two hours later we finished playing this game. And that was the game that led us to then qualify for the London Olympics. And I think at that point, after... To be able to come and play that tournament and be down by five goals at halftime or going into fourth, you know, and then play a shootout, you know, that was not only in my tough bank, but that was like the collective tough bank for our team. I mean, that team went through so much between 2009 and 2012 that, you know, it was just kind of adding to that. But you need to really encourage your athletes, your goalkeepers to reflect on all of these experiences, is good or bad, because coming off of that Shanghai tournament, that world championship, that sixth place finish, I mean, nothing felt worse. You know, like I was questioning whether I could continue on through London, which was a year later. You know, I was like, okay, just get through Pan Am Games, just get through Pan Am Games, and then you can decide. You know, I mean, these are the things where it's important for us to know it's okay to question our role, it's okay to struggle, and especially as a goalkeeper, you're gonna be under a microscope in that situation a lot more. You know, I mean, it might not be your fault that a goal goes in, but it's gonna look like your fault if you don't make the save in a lot of ways, you know, just because you're the last line that it goes through. So teaching our goalkeepers that, in a way that doesn't make them ambivalent to whether or not the shot goes. That's really important for them, not for them to start taking like, okay, well, I'm in charge of the defense, so it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. We don't want that, but we want them to have that understanding of really making sure that, you know, it's, we're coming from a position of reacting, we're coming from a position of imbalance, we're coming, you know, knowing what you're up against, but also knowing that you're capable to do some really amazing, excellent stuff through all of that. Um, is huge. So, uh, you know, the mental toughness component is something I'm really working on getting some more resources out into the water polo goalkeeper world in the year to come. Um, but that's important. Did you have a specific, like, reset routine, like, after that score on Anderson? Yes and no. Did I have a specific, like, mantra or anything? Sometimes, I, I think I worked through a lot of different ones throughout my entire career. <laughs> Um, some of them were more effective than others. Self-talk is huge, right? If we teach our goalies how to talk to ourselves, I worked, you know, I was a big fan of our sports psychologist. I worked a lot one-on-one -on -one with him. 
you know, there was one point in my career where he was like, well, what if you change your language, right? And you change, you know, because I would always go in feeling immensely guilty about all these goals that I should be blocking, right? I was like, oh, it's my fault, that's my fault, that. And he's like, well, what if you just flip it and it's like, instead of saying I should make that save, you say I want to make that save, you know? And just having that, again, that's where like my emphasis on language comes in because I think that it just is really powerful in how we communicate with ourselves, especially when you're coaching women, you know, and just making sure that there isn't this feeling of like inadequacy if you can't make a save, right? And that, you know, it's, look, it's here, we have the video, <laughs> let's watch it, let's force ourselves to be uncomfortable and see where the error, I can't even tell you how many tournaments, you know, we go to these FINA tournaments and there's professional photographers there and we're like flipping through the, tur the tournament photos like throughout, you know, halfway through the tournament, I'm like, oh my God, I hope my coaches aren't looking at these because I'm like, my eyes are closed or I'm making a weird face, I mean, it's a really fun thing to kind of look through and just be accepting of um, and say like, okay, like actually I can still be a phenomenal goalkeeper. And, you know, I also tell my goalies like recoiling, like turning your head. I mean, that's a, that's a fight or flight reaction, right? That's like a, in our physiology to try to move away from an object that's coming straight out, like a water pole ball that's flying at you. So, I mean, it's, again, it's how are we gonna manage that? How are we gonna like force ourselves to follow it anyway? But, you know, being accepting of the reality of the situation sometimes. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you guys. Yeah.